Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, I'm Lindsay, a doll from the Netherlands. (laughs) Same as last week. Same doll. Same doll. Doll's back. She's here. I I like um, how your pink lipstick, what it does to the uh, your coffee cup, coffee cup to go coffee cup. Yeah, well, that's the joys that of being a woman. I love that. Yeah, it's a fun color. Oh, thanks. Uh, very quick announcements and then show today. Okay, let's do it. Okay. Uh, first, a new Dance with the Devil graphic tee in the store at badmagicmerch.com. Softer, maybe less less scary design. Oh. Safe for the, the peeper crowd. Hmm. But still very cool. Uh, so many great designs up at badmagicmerch.com. Wow, you're done? Uh, that, that's all I have. My turn. Yeah. Welcome to May. Mm-hmm. As you're listening to this, don't forget Mother's Day is Sunday. Don't let the mothers in your life down. <laughs> I'm so excited to share this month's charity. Our good friend Joe DeMeo told me about the Halo Dental Network. And as soon as I read about what they were doing, I thought it was just so special and needed some attention from us. Uh, our amount is to be determined. As you know, we record in advance. Um, but I want to tell you what Halo's up to. Yeah. Uh, it was founded by Dr. Brady Smith. The Halo Dental Network is a coalition of dental professionals who donate their services to the dental underdeserved. Un- dental undeserved mm-hmm. services include dental implants, veneers, fillings, and crowns. Uh, I watched this video that they have up. It, it will break you. It will yeah. absolutely destroy you. Just completely transforming people's smiles and giving them so much confidence and which can help so much with job interviews and relationships, everything. L- Self-esteem. Li- literally, that is exactly. And it's like I... My mom worked in dental, so I completely took for granted all of the free dental care I've had in my life and mm-hmm. like how my smile gives me so much confidence. So yeah. it's a really, really cool... Uh, program that they have going. Uh, if you want to learn more about it or you want a tearjerker, it's uh, halodentalnetwork.org. Not only can you donate, you can also nominate yourself or someone in your life who is in need. Oh, cool. It's very cool. That is cool. Good pick. Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks to Joe DeMeo for uh, reaching out about that. Joe, uh, also friends with Darren from Cannaburst. Uh, oh, man. If you're into the gummies, Cannaburst yeah. is the way to go. Because mm-hmm. uh, I think they're, they're in Oklahoma. And Washington only, I think. Maybe in Oregon. But definitely in Washington, definitely in Oklahoma. I don't know. Uh, can I tell you about my uh, two stories today? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I have one that's pretty traditional, one very different from most of the stories we've told here. Uh, first is the story of a Virginia woman who may have had a demon essentially summoned to attack her by a jilted, unstable, and occult-obsessed man. Ooh, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, could, could he be responsible for the haunting that would take place in her home that would terrorize her and her husband for over two years and also leave her with physical wounds? Ooh. My second story, the very strange tale of Polybius, that a very unusual video game show up in Portland, Oregon arcades for just one month in 1981. I was literally going to say, is that the name of a video game? <laughs> yeah. Uh, a game speculated by some, if the whole thing isn't just an urban legend, to be part of some CIA mind control program with possible ties to men in black and thus extraterrestrial lore, maybe ties to the occult. GTFO. Yeah, it's, it's a weird story. Okay. Mm-hmm. It's very interesting. I, I got lost a little bit. I mean, there's a, an, it almost could have fit for like um, Time Suck. Not quite enough, but it's just, it's just an interesting story. Okay. Uh, what do you have for us today? I unintentionally have a theme of black dogs hmm. this week. Uh, my first story... There is the omen of the black dog, which I was unaware of, and I'll share with you a little bit about that in my first story. And then my second story, uh, another black dog that shows up in a haunted apartment. There's balloons involved. I know how much you hate balloons. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a really trippy kind of story. When you said the balloon thing, I I just made me think of like a really weird like ghost or like demon who just like sneaks up on me just to pop balloons right behind me. Dan like hates a balloon. How, that's how he scares me. Balloons freak Dan out because he thinks that they're going to pop unexpectedly at well, any get, moment. I get and startled. you're so jumpy. Yeah. So I, it's just annoying. No one's jumpier than Dan Cummins. <laughs> Literally no one. Try me. Jumpy. 
Okay, I just want you to know also one thing that I'm going to do on this episode. One word that we like to say like repetitively and over and over is oh boy. interesting. So I'm going to keep a tally of how many oh times no. we say it. Well, now I'm going to try not to say it. <laughs> Man. It's just going to come out. Oh, you know what? It's like, I, I, it was that interesting? You know what's so interesting? Were fans making fun of us? No, I'm making fun of us in my head. <laughs> okay. All right. I, I got stuck into a cool... Uh, uh, just loop a while back and I was yeah. trying to make some social media video with Logan. So cool. And I, and I look back and it's like, it was the only adjective I used. <laughs> so it's like this cool, we got this cool thing and it's cool. Yeah. And just, you know, be super cool if you checked out our cool thing. It's like, man, do you not know any other adjectives? You know how I'm so spongy, like the true empath in me, mm -hmm. I absorb other people's energy, but also their actions, their words. And I absorbed from Kate, uh, Logan's wife. Yeah. Wild. I say wild a lot now. Well, like, I gave it to you. It's like a oh, fucking man. disease. Wow, I'm, that's wild, man. It's, I'm like, whoa, that's wild. I'm like, oh yeah. Like, you know what's wild? <laughs> wild, wild, wild. Like just, I cannot stop. That's it's wild. so obnoxious. I hope Kate's not saying it anymore because I took it from her. That's wild, cool, and interesting. <laughs> <laughs> We're like a band. We're like TLC. <laughs> uh, are you ready for my first tale? Yeah. Okay, just a little setup, and then we're into it. Do you have socks to show or no? <laughs> yeah, I have some really cool, wild, interesting socks. Oh, man, socks. those are super wild, interesting socks you got. <laughs> this is not setting the right tone. I can't stop laughing. We've seen these before. I'm only going to show you one foot. Well, let's see if I can gracefully do this. Joe's going to guard all my bits. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> Perfect. If you can read this. Send. Send more, more crystals. crystals. Send Funny. more crystals. Oh, and just one other thing really quick. Okay. On the Mother's Day note, I was at Target the other day, and if you have a stepmom in your life, they have kitchen towels that say best bonus mom ever Aww. in the $5 section, and that's like a new trend cool. in things. So if you are a stepmom, have a stepmom, win bonus points by getting that. That's cool. Okay, I'm out. Okay, so now horror. The town of Manassas, located in Northern Virginia, was where Stephanie Winters and her new husband, Nick, chose to buy their first house together. They were excited to be homeowners for the first time after years of renting. Manassas, a picturesque little city of about 40,000, not far from Arlington and then Washington, D.C., and it has an especially bloody history, being most well known for the Manassas National Battlefield Park, the site of two major Civil War battles resulting in the deaths of over 20,000 soldiers. Some locals believe that some of the land was scarred so much by the bloodshed that it became cursed in a way. Stephanie and Nick had heard the war stories and paid them no mind. They were eager to move in, get settled. Their house was a charming little cottage-type building with plenty of space and its own garden. The newlyweds thought it was perfect for them. Once they were settled in, Nick continued working long days at his construction job, and Stephanie picked up a job bartending at a popular local drinking spot. It was at this job where she would regrettably meet Pete, and Pete would turn her whole life upside down. Time now for the tale of the summoning. It was in the fall of 2008. Stephanie was invited to a party at Pete's place. She wasn't sure if she wanted to go. She wasn't sure if she really liked Pete. In the bartending business, Stephanie felt that flirting was just part of the job, and most people seemed to understand that it was harmless, but she worried that maybe Pete didn't get that. But a couple of Stephanie's new friends were going to the party, so she accepted the invite. After a few drinks and chatting with friends, Stephanie found herself alone for a moment, perusing a bookshelf in the corner of Pete's living room. She was drawn to it because all the books on the shelf looked very old, and she'd always found old books fun to look through and wonder who'd read them before. How many people had also once held them? She soon discovered that a lot of the books seemed to be about the occult. As Stephanie moved her fingers over their cracked spines, a shiver ran down her back. And she thought to herself, wow, this guy really is a weirdo. Stephanie was then jerked out of her thinking as she felt a hand grab her waist. She turned around slowly and found herself face to face with Pete. And he was leaning forward as if to kiss her. Stephanie heard the slap before her brain even registered that she'd hit him. Ooh. You know I'm married, she shouted. This didn't cause Pete, unfortunately, to back away and apologize. Instead, he grabbed her wrist tightly in one of his hands, so tight it felt like it might snap. Stephanie struggled and screamed, and she hit Pete in the head repeatedly. She then felt a stinging pain as Pete ripped out several strands of her hair and held them in front of her. What the fuck? Let's see what you're saying after I do a love spell, he chuckled, running the hair along the top of his lip and breathing in the scent. He finally let go. She bolted out of the apartment, running home as fast as she could. When she got home, Nick was already asleep, so she climbed as gently as she could into bed beside him, tried her best to put the strange events of the evening out of her mind. She was worried if she told him that Nick might try and do something, like kick in Pete's door and hurt him, so she kept the incident to herself. Early the next morning, Stephanie was cleaning up the kitchen like she usually did. Nick had just left for work. Stephanie was then surprised by a loud knock at the front door. She wondered... Who in the world would be knocking on their door at 5.30 in the morning? 
Her heart sank as she opened the door. No. It was Pete. He held a bouquet of roses in his hand, and that fake grin she hated more than ever plastered onto his face. I came to say sorry for last night, he explained. Okay, thank you, she replied, closing the door slowly as she spoke, an uncomfortable feeling settling in with her. She thought, this man is insane, and I'm home alone. Pete stuck his foot in the door. Let's just talk for a bit, he said as he tried to push his way inside. Stephanie's uncomfortable feeling turned to anxiety and anger. She gave Pete a hard shove, pushed him clear of the doorway, shouting, Get out! Get out of my house! Bitch! Pete shouted as the door slammed in his face. He threw the bouquet of roses at the door, kicked it as he heard her lock it from the inside. She wanted to tell Nick, but again she was worried about how he would react, and she felt stupid for going to a party at Pete's house in the first place when she was already worried that he had a thing for her. Fortunately, Pete stopped showing up at the bar she worked at after that. Thank God. A few weeks later, after telling no one, with the situation with Pete mostly gone from her mind, Stephanie was awoken in the middle of the night by a loud crash coming from somewhere inside her home. She shook Nick awake and he jumped out of bed, grabbing a baseball bat he kept under the bed for a weapon. Stephanie followed behind him as they slowly made their way to the kitchen and they now saw Stephanie's favorite set of crockery and pieces on the floor. There was no way the plates could have fallen from where they'd been stacked, no shelves had given way or anything, but a search of the house turned up no intruders. Both Nick and Stephanie were spooked and also tired, and neither one of them jumped any paranormal conclusions after just this one event. But then other strange things began to happen. Objects seemed to move around the house on their own, and then they both claimed to actually witness objects levitate up into the air. For example, Nick, besides his construction job, made extra money from tattooing his friends at their house. And one afternoon, while he was working on a tattoo design, he witnessed a heavy metal candlestick lift itself up from the mantle and fly right across the room, narrowly missing his head. At this point, the odd occurrences going on around the house were not really scaring Nick and Stephanie, though. In fact, they actually found it quite exciting that they might have a ghost residing with them. But that feeling would soon change. In February of 2009, things took a sinister turn for the couple. One night, while they were both sleeping, Nick awoke to the sound of Stephanie screaming. <gasps> It burns! It burns! She repeated in anguish. Nick gently took Stephanie into his arms, searched for the source of her pain. There on his wife's back, three claw marks. Three large bleeding claw marks with absolutely no explanation as to how they got there. Nick took Stephanie downstairs, cleaned her wounds, put a bandage over the scratches. They were alarmingly deep. He tried his best to comfort Stephanie, who was understandably in hysterics. Nick tried to hide his own terror so as not to add to her hysteria. Stephanie had no tears on her clothes and was lying underneath blankets. What had scratched her and how? He was convinced it was something paranormal. They both were. Stephanie hadn't told many people about their ghost up until this point. Now she confided, into a, uh, confided to a friend and showed her the marks on her back. Her concerned friend knocked on Stephanie's door a few days later, accompanied by a psychic. She thought they needed to know what they were dealing with so they could try and banish it from their home before it hurt her or anyone else again. So-called psychic was a woman in her 50s and had a bit of an eccentric look. At first, Stephanie was annoyed that her friend had brought this weirdo into her house, but she did seem genuine and she was kind. So Stephanie allowed her to take a walk around the house and see what energy she could pick up. And after walking through all the rooms in the house and the garden, the three women sat together and the psychic explained what she felt. There's been a lot of tragedy on this land, she began, and a lot of tragedy in this house. A family lived here, a man, his wife, and their young son. The father was a jealous man, and in a fit of rage, he murdered his wife and son. I believe it is this man's spirit who is haunting you, maybe mistaking you for his dead wife and lashing out in fits of jealousy once more. Stephanie did not feel comforted by the psychic's words. In fact, she felt worse now that their home might have some malevolent entity in it, one that was fixated on her, one that was watching she and Nick and potentially, if not probably, waiting to make its next move and harm her again or him or both of them. And the psychic did not provide any instructions for helping to get rid of the spirit. She now felt anxious in her new house almost all the time. Then one day, while Stephanie was rebandaging her wounds, which still had not healed more than a week after she'd been attacked, she saw what she was certain was a little boy, around five or six years old, running past the doorway to the bathroom. He didn't look like a ghost. He looked like a real live little boy. By the time she'd stuck her head around the door to look for him, he'd vanished and she'd never see him again. Later that same day, she was washing dishes and staring out the window when suddenly three claw marks ripped their way across her arm. Stephanie dropped the bowl she was holding as familiar hot, searing pain shot through her. Her arm felt like it was on fire and blood dripped on the white kitchen tile. 
When Nick came home from work, he knew exactly what had happened as soon as he saw the bandages on his wife's arm. He held Stephanie and she cried for what felt like hours. Nick felt hopeless. Something was hurting his wife and there didn't seem to be anything he could do to stop it. Thankfully for the next few months, other than the near, other than the near constant feeling of being watched, the Winters house was paranormally quiet. But then in November of 2009, it all started up again. Nick had a friend that a friend's girlfriend over while he worked on a tattoo. At one point, Stephanie left the living room to get drinks for everyone, and then when she re-entered the room coming back from the kitchen, all three heads turned as glass shattered everywhere and Stephanie fell to the floor with a thump. Fresh claw marks appeared now on her leg. Blood gushed from the wounds, and the guests fled the house. Nick, feeling even more powerless than ever, clung to his wife, unable to hide his own tears now. And for the next six weeks, every week, without fail, Stephanie would be, would be attacked again. She and Nick felt alone. They worried that if they told someone, no one would believe them, or worse, they'd just call them crazy. After weeks of searching for help, they finally found it with paranormal investigator Rick Ossetine, a member of CPRI, the Center for Paranormal Research and Investigation. The couple went to see him in his office, where he conducted a short interview and inspected Stephanie's injuries. It was his opinion that although ghosts may also be present in the house, the entity tormenting and actively physically harming Stephanie was demonic. He asked Stephanie if she had any enemies or anyone who would want to harm her, someone who may have had an interest in the occult. Stephanie's jaw dropped. Pete. She now talked about what had happened a year earlier in the fall of 2008. She remembered Pete saying something about a love spell. Could Pete have summoned a demon in order to get revenge on her for being rejected? After filling Rick in on the uh, events of the past year, he promised the couple he would attend the home the following week to conduct a paranormal investigation. Rick arrived as planned, set up cameras and equipment around the house. He stayed that night to monitor activity. And then he, Nick, and Stephanie were all disappointed when the first phase of the investigation turned up no evidence of anything paranormal. But then as soon as Rick left, how many times here have we talked about this type of thing happening, Stephanie is scratched again. It was as if the entity wanted to drive Stephanie and Nick mad by making others doubt their stories. This pattern would continue for a few weeks until Stephanie was covered in bandages and in the depths of a deep depression. Oh, get the fuck out of there. The couple wanted to move out of the house, but Rick was adamant that this, would not, uh, that this would not put an end to their problems as demonic entities attach themselves to people oftentimes and are not always bound to just some place. Stephanie started talking... Uh, Stephanie started taking to staying in bed a lot now. She felt tired and irritable most days. She didn't want to leave the house and have people see her covered in bandages. She didn't want to watch other people living normal lives while she suffered and was tormented. And her torment, already substantial, would escalate. As On one of these days when she was bedbound, Nick left the room to make his wife a sandwich, concerned that she hadn't been eating enough. And just a moment after he left their bedroom, Stephanie felt a burning pain on her ankles. Something wasn't just scratching her this time, it was grabbing her, and she felt herself being pulled down and off the bed. She tried to scream, but all of a sudden it felt like some very large, unseen presence was on top of her, with his claws around her neck, squeezing tightly, preventing her screams as she now struggled for breath. She worried it was going to kill her. Nick walked back into the room to see his wife gasping for air, unable to move. He ran to her, trying to put arms around her to lift her up, but the entity would not let her go. Get off her! Nick screamed into the air. Leave her alone! All of a sudden, Stephanie was freed and sat up gasping for air through tears. The couple knew they could not carry on like this. Nick was terrified he was going to lose his wife, so they called Rick again. Rick was concerned for Stephanie's safety. This was obviously an extremely malevolent entity. He wanted to have a priest conduct an exorcism, but he needed approval from the church for that, and he didn't believe they had the time to get all the proper evidence and documentation they needed. At a loss for what to do, he contacted a friend who worked as a demonologist. His friend gave him instructions for how to perform a sealing ritual in the home. His friend explained that while it may not get rid of the entity for good, it should definitely subdue it. Rick soon came to the couple's house armed with candles, incense blessed by a priest, and holy water to perform this sealing ritual. The three of them walked around each room of the house with the candles and incense burning, sprinkling drops of holy water and reciting a prayer. Nick and Stephanie would go on to do this every night for almost a year. Holy crap! It seemed to work. The couple were no longer disturbed as long as the blessing was performed every night. And life slowly went back to normal for them until March of 2011. That night, while doing dishes, Stephanie was peering out the window when she thought she saw the dark outline of a man outside. She screamed for Nick, who quickly ran outside to investigate. And then as soon as the door closed behind Nick, Stephanie felt something grab her head from behind, pull her violently backwards down onto the floor. And then her invisible attacker vanished. 
Stephanie broke down in tears on the kitchen floor, not ready for all the trouble to start all over again. They called Rick again, who soon arrived ready to conduct a 48-hour investigation the following month in April of 2011. He wanted to finally try and put an end to the situation for the couple, whom he had grown to care about deeply. Not surprisingly, nothing happened on the first night he was back in the house. Rick then suggested they stop performing the nightly sealing ritual for the duration of his stay. He wanted to bait the entity into providing them with enough evidence to get a church-sanctioned exorcism. They recorded Stephanie for the entirety of the following night. She was scratched once, but unfortunately it was off camera. And Rick didn't believe the scratches would be convincing evidence for the church since they could argue that she'd hurt herself while off camera in the kitchen. But then only an hour after the sealing ritual should have taken place that evening, Stephanie was again violently scratched on the arm while standing in the kitchen, severe enough for blood to splatter across the room, and this time it happened on film. Finally, they had the proof they needed. Rick handed the evidence over to Dave Considine, a demonologist based in Connecticut. Dave agreed to pass off the evidence to a local priest he knew, but he was concerned that Stephanie may be under an extreme um, form of demonic oppression and that there wouldn't be time for the normal protocol to help her before something worse happened to her. Demonic oppression is the last step in demonic possession uh, before a demon can fully take possession of a person. During demonic oppression, the demon attaches itself to the person, invading thoughts and feelings before taking full control of the victim's body. Dave wanted to run a little test to be certain this was a case of oppression. He arranged for a mass to be said in Stephanie's name the next day. His thinking here was that if the mass was said purely in dedication to Stephanie, there would be some adverse reaction from her if she was truly being oppressed by a demon. Without telling Stephanie about this plan, he had Rick turn up at her house moments before the mass was due to start, with Rick claiming he thought he'd accidentally left something behind. And about 10 minutes after Rick arrived, as the mass was in progress, Stephanie clutched her head and fell to the ground in agony. She later said that blinding pain rushed through her head and she couldn't stand up. Nick carried her to the sofa while Rick placed a call to Dave. Certain now that they had no time to waste, Dave instructed Rick into how to perform a minor exorcism while they awaited a full exorcism. Rick, Nick, and Stephanie joined hands, read the exorcism ritual together over and over for hours. And incredibly, out of nowhere, the oppressive atmosphere in the house lifted and a bright light shone through the windows. It seemed like it had worked. Stephanie and Nick did not want to get their hopes up straight away. They lived in fear for a long time, always waiting for the attacks and strange happenings to return. Stephanie said she took years to recover mentally, but it seems that, after all that, the minor exorcism did indeed work. I bet they wish they reached out to the church a whole lot earlier. Stephanie and Nick, it seems, are still living in their little house in Manassas and enjoying a normal life. No word on whether or not they ever confronted Pete about his role in any of this. I'm guessing they both have stayed far, far clear of that guy. Hmm. Weird, huh? Pete's a weirdo. Mm-hmm. Pete, not only is Pete uh, like culty weirdo, he's also rapey. He's a very, yes. like... A, He's bad in a variety of ways. Ugh, I do not like him. No, no, I don't think uh, Pete is not a likable guy. No, and I find it interesting that we, like, talk about, like, waitressing or bartending. It's like, why is flirting part of that job? I mean, I was a waitress for many years, and it is. It's like, the more you're flirty, the better tips you make. Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's why, right? I mean, just right there, it's like, I, I, I mean, I'm sure, especially with PR and different things now and the times we live in, it's like, I, I wouldn't think too many managers are like, hey, you got to flirt. No, they but, never but, told but us to, but right, it was but it's just like, like a natural like, tendency, right? Just to get more tips. I mean, I would imagine like I mean, you do it, you get more tips and then you do it again. I did meet a boyfriend working at the bar. Okay. So I guess it worked. <laughs> I remember one time a customer of mine Grabbed me by the arm, pulled me close, and said, mm, "You smell like sex." I was Whoa. like, "Whoa, okay." Yeek. It's that's the thing is, it's like a weird, creepy line, and I yeah. I feel like we had like some old timers that would come in that were entirely harmless that I yeah. loved. Like they would come in and drink coffee while sitting at the bar, sure, and they were like old man flirty because yeah. we're talking like 75, 80, yeah, you know. Yeah. And I was like, "Oh, you sweet thing, like you just want like a pretty young girl to smile at you." Yeah, totally fine. But I think that it like. It's very easy to cross that line of like, oh, she's flirting with me. She likes mm -hmm. me. And then they start coming back every week or every day to see you. I don't yeah. know. It's like a, such a weird thing. Yeah, it's a dangerous game that like without deviating the show entirely. But I remember watching many years ago this documentary on HBO about um, exotic dancers. And mm, about, and about oh, I bet. them stringing. And this one lady was just very candid talking about how she very intentionally would string guys along to get more and more money at them and then start getting them to like pay her rent and all kinds of stuff. 
And then, you know, eventually they would get angry that they mm -hmm. were just being let along. And then, you know, would she move on to the next guy? Ooh. But I just thought like, man, but if you do that with the wrong unstable guy, it's like, yikes. Well, that's, and so you I- a, a Pete or whatever, yeah. Yeah, never occurred to me that in my flirting in order to make tips, to make mm -hmm. rent, that I could be flirting with someone who, I mean, I was always a little like, oh, gotta be careful. Mm -hmm. I never thought that they would put a curse on me. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a, yeah. I know, very but unusual. like- but maybe. Yeah, who knows? If Yeah, if that's possible. I Yeet. guess the Pete's of the world could do it. Pete, you're naughty. No, uh, I couldn't find any pics associated with this, uh, anything other than like dra dramatic recreation stills of the story from the Travel Channel series a Haunting, oh. where the story is first told. Uh, so you know what? I came across a demon girl. And uh, so there you go. Just to have something. Hmm. Cool image. I feel like you just like her. Well, she was the less... The, or not the least, the least out of when you when you search for demon lady or demon girl. Really? She was like the least sexualized. <laughs> like, How weird. Uh-huh. Well, it's like- What does uh, that say about our society? I think it says less about society and more about um, nerds who are good at like illustrating. That. It's almost, it's mostly dudes and it's mostly, uh, I don't want to stereotype. In Go my ahead. experience, talking, it's like there's a lot of guys who maybe at least when they were growing up, mm -hmm. didn't have the most luck with ladies. I mean, I was, uh, I didn't have a lot of luck with ladies, you know, growing up in- uh, Look at you, you know, now. <laughs> in uh, junior high, high school. And I love to draw like uh, vixens. I love a doodle. And it's like, oh yeah. And it was, and it was, the same rudimentary versions of what you find in like uh, these graphic illustrated novels and stuff today, it was always, maybe just like big boobs are easier to draw. Well, it's than, true. They're just like big. Uh-huh. Like it's like easier shapes and it's just a more exaggerated like sexuality mm -hmm. that you crave. And mm -hmm. so, yeah. But but I love that like that kind of artwork is, um, I mean, there's exceptions, but by and large, you feel something weird in your arm? Yeah, I felt like something touched me. Huh. But it's a poofy dress. Maybe the poof just went down. But yeah, that's uh, there's so many of those pictures. And then and then uh, this next one, just a creepy, uh, you know, a yeah. culty photo. Maybe that's Pete. Maybe it's, that's maybe that's Pete facing the Baphomet, or maybe Pete's in some kind of Baphomet mask. Oh, Pete! Pete is is naughty. <laughs> uh, I can't believe that they, after the exorcism, that they stayed. Sell the house. Move on. Yeah, but I guess uh, I guess it worked. Uh, I don't think that I would ever feel comfortable again, though. I, I wouldn't yeah. be able to f to fully relax. Mm, mm -hmm. I see what you're saying, yeah. And it just, mm, I don't know. And after that little Baphomet photo, I just had this pop in my head. Tell me. Uh, I do find it interesting. That, well, Baphomet is not, it's, it's a made-up um, demonic entity from, like, uh, medieval Europe. It doesn't come from any kind of, like, biblical or even in the first, like, thousand years of lore that followed, you know, like uh, the Bible, like the New Testament mm -hmm. and uh, the Church of Satan, you know, associated with Baphomet. They actually do, if you look into them, they do so much good work. Church of Satan? Oh, yeah. Do you know that there's Huge a satanic temple here? That's what I meant, satanic temple. I get, they're, they're actually different. Oh. It's, um, it's kind of like within Christianity, there's sure. denominations. It's, I will confuse the two, but yeah, a satanic temple, they do so much uh, philanthropic work mm -hmm. and they've like raised a bunch of money for Ukraine and like uh, women's rights, I mean, all kinds of stuff. There's the satanic temple here in Coeur d'Alene. It's got to be what, like five people? I don't know. We should join. Make it seven. Oh, boy. Come on. <laughs> you know what? I mean, it it, it is um, obviously, um, if you're Christian, you're here like, oh, what? Why would you even consider that? Mm -hmm. It is not what people think. I, I did an episode on it, you know, for Time Suck on Satanism. It is so not with they're more just rabble rousers they're more just like mischievous people who just like to do good and um and for whatever a variety of reasons have a problem with organized religion specifically christianity yeah but they tend not to be bad people at all it's an interesting little organization i like that you just said rabble rouser well when you it's not often it's a, it's a cool interesting word it's wild <laughs> I love you. <laughs> uh, are you uh, ready to move away from possible demons and move towards uh, possible mind control experimentation? Well, I just have one more question. I just want a, um, a sealing ritual, like seal it in a jar or like the ceiling? It's um, sealing. It's C-E-I-L-I-N-G. It's, C -E -I -L -I -N -G. it's um, Lionel Richie came up with it. <laughs> and uh, he's the one who started it and is, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, the dance dancing on the sea then. Don't mock him. I love him. <laughs> I'm not mocking him. No, it's um it's sealing S E A L. Like you're like sealing seal something. Yeah, like sealing the demon out of your home, I guess. Yeah. I don't, and I don't know what what the ritual entails, and I'm sure there's a, a variety of sealing rituals. Yeah, I kept waiting for you to say like of the things that they brought, there was like a jar or something. Like they were gonna try and contain it and seal it in there. But oh. 
But then I got confused and I was like, well, maybe. And then I was like, <laughs> my brain is so ridiculous. I was like, or maybe they just want it to stay on the ceiling. Just like, listen, demon, you just <laughs> you just stay up there. What a feeling when you're dancing on the ceiling. Demons on the ceiling. Demons on the ceiling. I like the ceiling it in little jars, what you said. Because then I, that made <laughs> like me picture. Like lightning bugs in a mason jar? That made me picture like my grandma's cellar, like, like instead of like pears, like... Uh, <laughs> And, you know, like peaches and stuff, like bottled pears. You just like a bunch of mason jars and there's like, that's a uh, Baphomet and that's a uh, Azumel. And just like a oh, variety, be fun. Mm-hmm, variety of little demons in jars. And then there's an earthquake and they all fall down and all the demons oh, are released. Boy. That's a great premise for a horror movie. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. That sounds like Somebody's going to make kind of, millions off me. Some kind of Bruce Campbell uh, situation. Um, okay. Okay. Moving on. Moving on. This is an especially weird one. Quite a bit of setup on this one. And then we uh, we don't really head into a lot of scares. More strange, interesting, uh, possibly concerning than spooky, but but I still feel like it fits on the show. Okay. I, tr- I trust you. Thank you. Welcome. The 1980s, a time in America when many teenagers seem to experience a lot more freedom than ever before. The counterculture movement of the 60s and 70s paved the way for the teen years to be a time of true self-discovery and fun away from the prying eyes of parental supervision. And technological advances provided all new forms of fun for teens. The exploding arcade games market suddenly became big business, and these arcades became teen paradises. Bustling, laughter-filled dark, dark rooms with bright lights and video games popping up all around the country. Video games were seen by most as a pretty safe place for teens to waste their time and money. Much better places for kids to hang than drug-fueled parties or sex in the backseat of a car, uh, pulling death-defying daredevil stunts on dares, etc. Initially, though, this new form of digital entertainment had launched with a shaky start. Concerned parents, churches, and politicians feared that these games would corrupt the youth. Mm -hmm. That fear began with pinball machines featuring illustrations of scantily clad, big-breasted, sexually suggestive women, rock stars often linked to the occult. But then Pac-Man showed up, benign and safe. Donkey Kong, Mario also seemed harmless, and they were. Parents, many of them who had grown up on pinball games and realized that they hadn't, in fact, uh, been corrupted at all, well, they relaxed. And teens crowded inside arcades after school and on the weekend to get a chance to play the latest video game releases, games their parents mostly didn't even think to ask them about. And one day in 1981, in the Malibu Grand Prix Arcade in Portland, Oregon, an unmarked black arcade game appeared. And a few more would follow, popping up in other arcades in the suburbs of Portland. And maybe this new game that parents didn't even know about, maybe it wasn't so harmless. Full disclosure, some say none of this happened, that this game never existed, that this story is nothing more than urban legend, but others insist it was real. Some even say that they were one of the few who played this game, and they're convinced it hurt them and others, that it was maybe part of some government mind control experiment, or that it was a vehicle for dark paranormal forces to harm whoever played it. Time now for the tale of Polybius. Although the cabinet looked the same as many others, perhaps even duller and less flashy than some, this new game was clearly not like anything else on the market. Soon after it showed up, fights would break out in line over who got to play next. Kids were drawn to it so powerfully, so desperate to play it. And once they did play it for the first time, they were even more desperate to play it again. They became absolutely obsessed with it. They'd skip school to get to the arcade early. They'd steal money to play just a few more minutes. They'd miss meals to stand in line. And the more they played, the more this game allegedly, somehow, changed them. One account of the game comes from a boy only listed as Michael in sources. Michael was supposedly 14 when he went to the arcade with his buddy after school and played it for the first time. He and his friends spotted the new machine and waited their turn. They figured it must have been an awesome game to be attracting all these people. Michael doesn't remember about uh, how much, or doesn't remember much about how the game looked, but he remembers its name, Polybius, and that it was developed by some com- some company called uh, Cineloxin Incorporated. He also remembers that the game featured some sort of puzzles and bright colors, almost kaleidoscopic images. He was immediately hooked. He couldn't get enough. He stayed at the arcade until it closed the first day, either playing Polybius or waiting in line to play it again. And he did the same thing the next day and the day after that. And then the migraine started. Mm. Michael woke up, his head pounding, couldn't remember anything from the last few days. His parents took him to the doctor's office and they were no help. All they said was that Michael needed some sleep. That first migraine was followed by night terrors, followed by more migraines in the following days. Michael couldn't remember his new dreams exactly, just that there were strange men in black suits showing up in them and that he was afraid, very, very afraid. 
He had night terrors now. He'd wake up sweating and shaking, often screaming, uh, panicking his parents. Michael wouldn't be the only one to freak out after playing this game. There have been several other reports that the game produced intense psychoactive and addictive effects in the player. All across Oregon, teenagers were supposedly experiencing these same symptoms along with severe behavioral changes. Players allegedly experienced seizures, amnesia, insomnia, night terrors, hallucinations on top of powerful obsessions with Polybius. Even when these kids could barely see straight because of pounding head pain, they'd still drag themselves back to the arcades to play again. All these teens could talk about was Polybius. According to some online reports, a few of these kids died from medical complications, one even died by suicide, allegedly driven insane by whatever was happening in their minds. Some players reported that they didn't feel like their thoughts were their own, that something had gotten inside of them. Was the game somehow linked to the occult? Were these players becoming the victims of some kind of paranormal torment? And all of this, if it happened at all, happened in just a single month's time. Just one month after these strange games arrived, they vanished. And Polybius, in this initial form, was never seen or heard of again. And all that was left was rumors. There were no news reports about the strange effects of the game, no concerned parents rallying against the game to have it banned, nothing. For the next 13 years, it was like the game had never really existed. And then the internet came along. The very first internet references to Polybius supposedly occurred on a platform called Usenet in 1994. Usenet was a discussion forum in the early days of the web. However, one can't find any official records of Polybius on Usenet if you were to dig into their archives today. The earliest confirmed record of the game comes from an entry added to the arcade game resource CoinOp.org, February 6, 2000. CoinOp lists the Polybius Usenet page as, in, as originating in 1998 rather than 1994. Uh, the entry mentions the title Polybius and the copyright date, 1981. But modern researchers uh, can't find any official copyright registration for the game. The section for the gameplay simply says unknown. The about the game section li uh, just lists rumors surrounding Polybius. In, sub in September of 2003, Kurt Kohler, the owner of CoinOp, submitted a message to the video game magazine GamePro about Polybius. And then Polybius appeared in the September 2003 issue as part of their series Secrets and Lies, the first printed reference for Polybius. The article discusses how users on CoinOp had spent hours and hours chatting about the game and trying to find hard evidence of its existence, but they couldn't find anything. No authentic cabinets, boards, ROMs, records of Polybius seem to exist anywhere. The mystery, uh, the mystery of Polybius continued without further development for several years. Then in 2006, a man named Stephen Roach claimed he was one of the original programmers of Polybius. He said a research team learned that a boy experienced a seizure while playing it, so the company withdrew all their cabinets. But is that true? Nothing more to it than a simple game that caused some adverse reactions in users, so they pulled it? No one has been able to verify Stephen's story as being real. Without any clear origin story, some conspiracy theorists proposed that Polybius was a secret CIA-run psychological experiment. There was an ancient Greek, Greek historian named Polybius, mostly known for writing the histories, an important work of documenting Greek and Roman history between 264 BCE and 146 BCE. This Polybius was a student of cryptology and created the Polybius Square, which substituted letters for numbers. And some researchers think that the game must have been named after him as players often refer to solving puzzles in the game. Also, maybe naming the game after an important historical figure makes it difficult to search for the game. Writer Brian Dunning describes the name of the alleged producer of the game, uh, Sinisloken, as not quite idiomatic German, meaning the game uh, was or the name wasn't formed with proper German grammar. Regardless, the translation of the game is thought to be, uh, or this name is thought to be, sensory deprivation. Why would a company name themselves Sensory Deprivation? Was their intention to somehow hypnotize game players to make them more susceptible to receiving information sent to them from the game? Dunning thinks that the legend of Polybius is just that, an urban legend, but one based off of some true events. He says that two video game players in Portland did happen to fall ill on the same day in 1981. 14-year-old Michael Lopez got sick while playing Temptus, or Tempest, and 12-year-old Brian Morrow fell ill while playing Asteroids. Michael did suffer from a severe migraine. Brian became extremely sick to his stomach after drinking too much soda in an effort to stay awake playing asteroids for 28 hours straight in an attempt to break the world record. Oh my gosh. He had to be admitted to the hospital. Thankfully, both of these boys did recover, but then tragically, two other gamers died in Portland within the following year. 
Jeff Daly, an 18-year-old competitive gamer, died of a heart attack in 1981 while trying to break the world record playing Berserk for the most hours straight. A year later, a 19-year-old boy died the same way. Also in 1981, FBI agents raided several arcades around Portland because they suspected the owners of using the games for gambling. And Brian thinks that the players getting sick, some of them dying, combined with FBI raids, led to the urban legend of Polybius. Additionally, in 1984, the film The Last Starfighter premiered, where a teen is recruited by aliens to play a monitored arcade game. He thinks it threw more gas on the fire. Others think people have confused the fake game Polybius for the real 1983 game Cube Quest. Cube Quest featured revolutionary visuals, was far ahead of its time, the first game to use real-time 3D graphics, and that game was truly removed from a lot of arcades shortly after it was released, but not for nefarious reasons. It just wasn't that fun to play. <laughs> Skeptics believe Kurt Kohler made up the entire Polybius legend to drive traffic to his website, coinop.org, and if that was true, it worked. If it's not true, what the hell was this game? Part of MK Ultra? Some MK Ultra adjacent CIA program? MK Ultra was a CIA led experimental mind control program. Was Polybius part of its effort to practice mind control techniques? Coin Op wrote on their page Polybius had a very limited release, one or two backwater arcades in a suburb of Portland, developed by some kind of weird military tech offshoot group, and used some kind of proprietary behavior modification algorithms developed for the CIA. Perhaps the game was related to subliminal messaging. Some of the children who supposedly played this game claimed they could hear barely audible voices telling them to keep playing. They also posted that sometimes messages would flash up on the screen almost faster than could be read. Finally, what about Men in Black? A phenomenon so strongly associated with extraterrestrial visitations and government cooperation with alien life. The one unanimous thing that alleged players described was the presence of strange men in black suits. And they didn't just show up in dreams like supposed former player Michael had, according to the lore, they showed up at the arcades as well. These men reportedly checked the game's high scores, changed out parts inside the cabinets, and then eventually took all the units away. Were these men in black data mining, analyzing the effects of the game, and why? Without any sort of official records, Polybius will remain a mystery. Did Polybius ever exist? Or did real events, government programs, pop culture combine to form a strange false memory or Mandela effect on a subset of the American population? In 2009, CoinOp amended their Polybius entry, promising to fly to the Ukraine to sort everything out. They felt they had made progress in discovering the truth behind the game, and they ended their message with, stay tuned. We're still waiting. It's a weird little story, right? Weird. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, why did they fly to the Ukraine? Uh, following some lead. Oh. Like they thought there was like some programmer or, you know, somebody, you know, responsible for making the game knew something and was out there. Well, and pretty soon here, like the people who made that game, if it was in fact real, aren't going to be alive anymore. <laughs> right. Eventually. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, because it came out in the 80s. I mean, I'm a baby of the <laughs> 80s. So like they have to be older than me by 20, 30 years. So Getting my, up there. My, oh, yeah, I guess to be able well, to sure, make yeah, it. Well, sure, yeah, they would have sure. been like yeah. anywhere in their early true. 20s to mid-30s probably. Yeah, that's true. So, you know, they're in their late 60s. In the next 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. they're out of here. And the secrets, if if they even exist, die with them. Was that me? I'm so you. sorry. Yeah. I didn't even feel that. <laughs> uh, I, what it made me think about was hypnosis. Oh, yeah. Like, uh -huh. as opposed to, like, I mean, which I suppose is a form of mind control, mm -hmm. but it just made me think, like, if you're playing this game, do 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 you got your little joystick, and things are moving in particular patterns, like, could the rapid eye movements of it hypnotize you? Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. If, yeah, that somebody could figure out some game to hypnotize you, and then what would they do to you once they did hypnotize you? I mean, that is pretty uh, wild, interesting, and cool to think that... If I'm still could, tracking your interesting. <laughs> if it could, if it could uh, hypnotize you, then it could, in that hypnotic state, you know, feed you kind of like false memories or you know, false kind of uh, or whatever um, manipulative commands to do things or to think certain things. I mean, it's uh, stuff somewhat theoretical, but I mean, but I mean, I mean, MK Ultra does exist, right? Uh, it did. Yep, that was a real program, and then you know the. Uh, the power of suggestion is very mm -hmm. real and people under, you know, hypnosis will do things they wouldn't normally do because Have they feel more. Have you ever been hypnotized? More. Nope. And I, and I don't want to be. I don't like it. I, I don't think I like it either. Yeah. I just, yeah. I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I just don't like, like, uh, I don't want to open up my mind to somebody being able to manipulate it in any way. Are you sure? <laughs> 
I've got ideas. Yeah, you got some ideas. You <laughs> change me in some ways. I don't want to change you permanently. There might yeah. be like a few little tweaks I could try out temporarily. Okay, see how you like it. <laughs> Silly. Uh, okay, let's explore. It's MK Ultra. Okay. Why experiment on kids? Who knows? That's a particularly interesting idea to me because I'm like, huh? What like? Hmm. Kids. Well, it, like, could, it could be okay. If I'm just uh, going with that angle, yeah. If I'm uh, some CIA uh, operative, or if I'm some scientist working with the CIA to come up with this, because uh, you know, MK Ultra was all about like trying to find this like truth serum, ba- basically trying to be like the premise was we need to find a way. If we capture a spy from some other country, we want to be able to have all the answers they give to our questions to know that they're 100 percent true. They can't withhold from us, right? So they were trying like different drug cocktails and drugs, tortured, drugs. you know, methods and stuff to uh, ensure that somebody would tell you the truth. They were going to try anything. And, and if let's say you're um, some computer programmer, you're like, well, what if this game could hypnotize people? And then under hypnosis which was way more popular back then than it is now. Mm-hmm. And, and they thought it, had, it was more powerful than it is now. Now they realize that people will say crazy shit under hypnosis is not true, just like they'll say in regular life. But um, what if what if we could get all this kind of truth from them? And they're like, okay, well, let's try and design that. What's a good test group? Kids play, especially okay, okay. kids you know, in, the, in 1981 are playing games more than adults. Different uh, now. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> I know. You weren't. Just, I was. I just want to let you know. I just graduated college. <laughs> <laughs> so creepy. <laughs> no, I was. Uh, yeah, I was working on my, my PhD. Um, no, I. Yeah, are those, I was, are I was those your doctor glasses? Those are my doctor glasses. I love those glasses. Thank you. Sexy. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay, well, you know, potato, 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 Who's, potato. Who knows what's going on with plebeius? Cool, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Or wild. Or or wild. Or paranormal. Or mm. not. Or just one of those unexplainable things yeah hmm. i i also like these glasses I, now that i'm used to them my eyes have adjusted with the new prescription yeah i, I see good so it's, it's crazy how that works <laughs> interesting it's crazy how i can see far away clear and close up clear is it cool is it wild it's so interesting and wild <laughs> <laughs> are you guys sick of this yet i don't know i think it's so funny ah, do you know the omen of the black dog pictures Oh, oh, ding! Good job, Joe. Hey, Tracking producer the Joe, the, I, this guy, oh, man. this guy. This Come on, the softest whisper pictures, guys. Guys, pictures, 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 pictures guys. No. We talked about pictures before well, the show. Remember? It's weird too because we I remember them. seeing this. Oh, you do? But I'm guessing it's like just weird, like a meme, like Mandela effect. Yeah, yeah. But I've, I've seen it so many times. I also am a gamer. Okay. I know that's what I was embedded thinking. Embedded in my brain that this existed. Well, this picture was re- was just created. Uh, like uh, they didn't claim this first picture we're gonna show that it is a picture of Polybius, mm-hmm. but just like based on you know the rumors, what it may have looked like. So here's like uh, the oh. the game, what it was supposed to be. Polybius. I know what it's pronounced. According to all the, the YouTube videos I watched, they said Polybius. I would, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. And then, and then what's interesting is it turned up in The Simpsons as a pop culture reference, as they will do. Uh-huh. So this next still from The Simpsons, there's Bart at the arcade. Next to him is Polybius. Oh, interesting. And then, cool. and then uh, going with some pinball art. <gasps> I love right? pinball machines. I do too. I love. Pinball. I would love to have like at some place, like have a house sometime with like some old pinball machines, cause, like with like the from the seventies. My mom These... used to be really good at pinball. Oh really? Yeah. I, I'm I'm I am shit dad? at pinball. I'm terrible at it, but I like the artwork. Okay, you know. Okay, if you're in, uh, I'm really bad at pinball. If you're in Nashville and yeah. you can go to the what's that hotel we stay at? I can picture it in the lobby in the oh, pinball game, man. but I can't think of the name of it. The Hutton. Yes. And. Yeah, or yeah. the Hudson. Hutton. No, no. Hutton, you're right. Hudson Burgers. Yeah. The Hutton. Hutton, yeah. Great hotel. And they have cool pinball machines. Yeah. And the last, well, the second to last time we were there, what famous musician did you see? Alice Cooper. There you go. Coming out of some secret room while I was playing pinball. That's what I think of now. And, and this next picture, this is Elvira. Oh, wait. Before that one, Joe. Hey, lady. I know. Uh, th- this is the Elvira on the pinball. Yes. Yes, that's, he showed that one. You just weren't Oh, I did? Attention. Okay, I, I wasn't looking. But that's like, yeah, that's the kind of things. And Elvi- and then I just, that one led me to the next picture Joe shows. But I, uh, Elvira was, was my introduction to horror when I was a little kid. Well, no wonder you were into it. Yes. And Elvira, I probably like my first crush, before you even knew what a crush was, because I, yeah. I couldn't have been more than five or six watching Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. And it was like, it was like she'd What's have that? these. It, it's an, it was an old show. I'm pulling this completely from memory, but this is memory from when I was like, six so this is questionable but it was just some kind of like it was a tv show and it was uh kind of like a i want to say a precursor to tales from the crypt 
oh. of like little vignettes, like shorter. It was either that or it was movies. But I want to say it was a lot of times like, you know, scary movies, quote unquote, mm-hmm. but more like Creature from the Black Lagoon. Like like Got these are old horror movies that weren't that scary. Who is Elvira I was able in real watch. life? I can't remember the actress's name, but she played Elvira for a long, long, a couple d- different decades. Is that, is that all and she And became did? like a cult. I mean, I'm sure there's some other things, but it was all that she became known for. It, yeah, you get kind of mm-hmm. sucked into it. She reminds me of Evangeline Lilly. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which I know it's not her, but. Yeah. Yeah. No, Avira, whoever the actress was, she became like, uh, I mean, show up at parades and stuff like, yeah. like that bee horror, which has a real like culty following. Yeah. And she became a big figure in that world. Mm-hmm. And she did a Playboy spread. Cassandra Cassie. Peterson. Thank Cassandra you. Peterson. Cassie. Oh, Cassie. Oh, oh, Cassie Peters. Oh, Cass. It's wild. That's interesting. So cool. <laughs> She's 5'7", in case you guys are wondering. <laughs> What other, okay. Never wow, mind. They, they make her look very tall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so cool that they can do that. With her hair, she's 6'6". Six, six. <laughs> can I tell you some stories now? Yes. Okay. I feel like we're a little all over the place this week. Ding, 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 ding. ding. It's the wild, interesting, they've got things. Uh, it's but, cool, but you know what? I feel wild, like when we got into the stories, we were locked in. Yeah. Okay. We can lock into new stories now. Okay. Do you know about the omen of the black dog? Do you know what I'm... Um, hey, I, buddy. Okay. I need you to focus. Uh... I have heard, yes. I'm familiar with like some kind of harbinger, some kind of messenger of sorts, or some kind of guardian of hell. There's like, I know that there's lore. I just can't remember what it is right now, but I have read it in the past. Okay, well, I, I wasn't actually that familiar with it. And mostly what comes it's up- It's a is, hellhound, right? Mm-hmm. And mostly in Irish folklore. I, I should have wrote this down, but I didn't. Because all Irish people go to hell. Nailed it. Little known fact. Yeah, they take the potatoes and they go to hell. Yep, they get their potatoes, they're demons. All Irish people are demons. Demon fact. potatoes. Um, <laughs> Demon taters. <laughs> Baked potatoes. <laughs> That's where that comes from. That's where they get. Bo- that's where they yeah. get roasted. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, a lot of it comes from Ireland. Though. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Where they might actually call it jacket potatoes, as oh, opposed I, uh, to a baked oh, okay. potato. Just FYI, because um, that's what they call it in London. Oh. So, hmm. anyways, um, okay, but it's like a, a warning. You know, death is coming for you, or maybe oh, so I was right, harbinger. Yeah, or maybe you know, maybe it's the devil, a symbol of the devil. Okay, yeah, like it's the devil's dog. Maybe. Mm-hmm. But I didn't, yeah. I didn't know, so I, I got lost in the internet a little bit, uh, and I, I I found that to be cool, interesting, and wild. <laughs> Good job. Thank you. Hello, Lindsay, Dan, and the Scared to Death crew. I'm I'm new to your show. You guys had me hooked with just one episode. Big thanks to old gods of Appalachia, Appalachia, Aww. who knows, for sending me, yes. and, and others, I'm sure, to your delightful chemistry and horrific tales. To stay true to your formula of stories first, chatter later, whoops, whoops, I bring you a story from the summer of 2009. I grew up somewhere between South Carolina's ever-growing towns, quiet neighborhoods, and its dense woodlands. Ever the odd kid, I didn't have too many friends, and as a result, cherished the ones I did have, making as much time as possible to just hang out with them whenever my parents allowed. It was a Sunday, and on Sundays, my mom's church held a second evening service, which provided the perfect excuse to go to youth group with my friend Nathan. We never actually attended youth group because, well, you know, teenagers. (laughs) Youth group would finish, and I would drop Nathan off at his house after our ritualistic Taco Bell run. His house was in a winding and poorly lit neighborhood, the sun long gone over the horizon, but I'd been there enough I could nearly navigate it with my eyes closed. The last sharp turn was partially obscured by a massive bush of razor grass, so we didn't see the black figure until it was on top of us. My heart came to a stop as my friend grabbed my arm in shock at the lengthy form in my headlights. The terror dissipated as we realized it was just the neighbor's dog. A black boar's eye? A sweet dog, but not that bright. But the horror passed, I dropped my friend off and began my drive home. Home was roughly 15 miles away through wooded back roads, but I knew them all well. A few minutes into the drive, I spotted something out of the corner of my eye to the left. A dark mass burst from the tree line making a dash for me, and not uh, with no time to stop or swerve, I braced for an impact that never came. I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw nothing in my taillights, but there was absolutely something next to me. Keeping pace with my car was what I thought to be a huge black dog. Of course that's what I thought. It's the only thing my brain could wrap itself around. I accelerated. 45. 50. 55. It kept pace. No, it was starting to overtake me. It was then that I got a good look at this dog. 
The size of it is what struck me, with the top of its massive shoulders nearly level with the roof of my Ford Taurus. Black, shaggy fur matted with what I hoped was mud rubbed against my car door. There were no ears atop its head, no eyes set in its skull, or even a nose on its snout. But it did have a mouth, a mouth full of jagged teeth, a mouth that didn't end where it should, but instead continued down the length of its throats and ended at its chest. I floored it. I could barely see through my panicked tears, but I knew if this thing got ahead of me, I was dead. I blasted down back roads in blind terror and slowly but surely began to overtake whatever this nightmare was. I wanted to go home, to safety, but I couldn't lead this thing there. So instead, I found myself on a highway, then the interstate, and even though I had left that hellhound behind me two minutes ago, I just couldn't stop. I arrived home several hours past curfew. I'd never been so happy to be fussed at. (laughs) <laughs> I've read about omens concerning a black dog that heralds misfortune and death. While I am very clearly still alive, as far as you know, I experienced the death of a friendship shortly after that night. Nathan and I went our separate ways. We both changed and not always for the better. If that was simply an omen of the impending death of our friendship, did it really have to scare the shit out of me? I'm sorry for the rambling nonsense, but I hope you found this fun and or frightening. Keep up the good work, everyone. I look forward to what is to come. With much love and a creep to the core, <laughs> Nora. Well, thank you, Nora. And sorry for the sneeze in the middle of your story. He you ruined everything. I, I had the mute button. I turned as far away as I could in the room. Hopefully it was not too audible. It was aggressive. Oh. It was well, not. It's always aggressive when I sneeze. That's it, just how my anatomy is. It wasn't wild or cool or no, even interesting. What, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Interesting story, though. I mean, yeah, there is... There's not a ton of stories compared to certain other paranormal entities about like these, um, yeah, these black dogs, these hellhounds. Hounds, yeah. Um, but they're, yeah, they're super interesting when you come across them. There's some road somewhere. I want to say Wisconsin, Michigan, somewhere in like the upper Midwest mm-hmm. where I remember coming across like lore of these dogs where there was like a whole bunch of sightings in like a couple of years. Huh. I wonder why. And there's a really weird phenomenon. I, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but like when... I remember it's, it being associated with truckers, with like long, you know, distance drivers, mm. where if you drive for too long on the road, like you, you don't get enough sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the like the um, <laughs> uh, little warnings or symptoms of like, hey, time to pull over. Time, yeah. Is you start hallucinating black dogs. Uh, really? It's some really weird. I have to look it up again. Like, see, but, but I remember reading about it so many years ago. And then I pulled a crazy long drive once, 24 hours straight. Whoa, where were you going and why did you not sleep? I drove from Albuquerque, New Mexico to Spokane, Washington in one stretch. Why? By myself. To prove that you could? Uh, just to save money. It was like really early on. Oh, and, I get that. Yeah, just to like, you know, not have to get a hotel or anything. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, between Missoula and, you know, Spokane, the last like three hours of the drive, Seeing like some shadow like dart across the road and be like, that's not good. And like rolling my window down and be like, okay. That's, Air conditioning on, yep. window down, music up. Yep. Let's yep. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Yeah. I can't believe you did that. Oh, only once. Uh, I would never do that. I mean, I it wrecked me for like the two following days. And I was I, I was young too. I was like, you know, I don't know, 25, 24, somewhere in there. And it still young just buck. wrecked me. I was, a young, I was a young buck. Oh, man. Oh, well, geez. Oh, geez. Well, I'm glad that you didn't crash and burn. Thank you. <laughs> That's just dumb, though. You yes. could have slept in your car. You could have pulled over and taken a nap. True, true. Mm-hmm. But I wanted to be, uh, I want to be wild, you know. So interesting. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, okay. Okay. One, one more kind of black dog tale. It shows up, but it's not. The story is not based around the black dog. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, okay. So one of the things that we consistently discuss are haunted places. And actually, last week we were talking about. McDill Air Air Force Base or like places that have existed for long periods of time and how, you know, the more things that happen, the the, the more confirmation, the more valid, all of that. Yeah. And on that note, we also think like, oh, well, if if a house was built on old burial grounds, like, right. But what about when a place is brand new? It's so, I feel as though it is very rare that we find a new. It does seem to be more rare. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a new apartment that has got some weird, weird stuff going on. Okay. All right, let's check it out. Oh, I have to turn the page. <laughs> That's cool. That's so wild. Good afternoon to the epicenters of the only STD that I'd want to give to both my wife and my parents. <laughs> I feel a little gross having nice. committed that one to writing. <laughs> and also to all the bad magi- magicians who support them uh, and give them the help they need to help me survive my daily commute. 
I'm a very recent, very big fan of the podcast. Ah, uh, thank you. An old coworker turned me on to Dan's comedy back in 2016, and a good friend from high school introduced me to the podcast. I was going to write in a couple times before. First, back in November, I was going to write in with my father's story because I didn't have one to call my own. Then, I moved into a new apartment, and after my third or fourth night, I had a brief experience that got me as far as drafting an email before deciding it wasn't even a story and deleting it all. Then last night happened, and holy guaca fucking moly, have I got a real-life spoopy story of my own. I'm going to call this a quick setup and do my best not to bore anyone. I've been a creeper since fifth grade, and like any good creep, I married a peeper. We're expecting our first child, and she refuses to watch any horror, joking that the stress it put her through would turn the baby ugly. <laughs> we recently moved into a new two-bedroom apartment. We were changing states yet again for my job, so I went ahead to lock down a place and get our feet under us while she kept watch over the pets and closed out our affairs back at the old homestead. Being away from your partner is never super easy. I'm sure lots of people can relate. But you have to appreciate the little things. I was binging horror movies and video games during all my free time when we weren't on the phone. It felt like I was back in college. The unbridled access to my fix made it easy to explain away my first event that I claimed as an encounter. I woke up in bed. I didn't know what time it was. There was enough light in the room to see everything, and it was the right color to know that it was the sun and not streetlights from the parking lot. This meant I needed to at least check the time, and at worst, panic, skip my entire morning routine, and rush to the office in the same clothes I wore the day before, because if you're going to be a mess, make it a spectacle. <laughs> Only problem being that it would require movement. I'm not going to say I couldn't move, I just wouldn't move. There was enough time for me to have that specific thought. I need to get up. I need to get my phone. And then from somewhere in my body, below my brain, and then from somewhere below my brain, my body said, nope. My door opened. A woman walked in and I thought nothing of it. She made sense in the space. I might have honestly thought she was my wife. I'll learn my lesson later. Then everything around me started getting dark, like she's a sponge soaking up all the light in the room without herself brightening up. I focused on her and she started crossing the room almost like she'd been inspecting how clean I kept the room. Then I remembered that my wife was not in the same state as me and wouldn't be for some time. Then, as if I offended her, she stormed out of the room and everything lit back up. More importantly, I could move again. I looked at my phone and it was the exact time I set my alarm for, 6.30 a.m., but my alarm was not going off. By the time I got to work, I had to tell someone, but I didn't know what to say. I didn't remember much about the woman. Some people talk about entities being dressed in centuries-old gowns, but I'm a youngish, Midwestern guy who still dresses like a latchkey kid. My fashion sense doesn't extend past a black t-shirt and jeans on a good day. Some peepers who lived in the same complex as me brought up that the apartments were, quote, too new to be haunted, and gave me the same lame Native American burial ground trope. I looked up the land before it was developed. If there were native peoples burying their dead here, I applaud their work ethic. It was a dense forest before it was developed, and Google Maps still doesn't know that there's a building where I charge my phone every night. Suck it, Google. <laughs> I never told my wife about the woman, and I didn't see her for a long time. Now, a quick breakdown of the space. When you enter, you're in a bit of a hallway, immediate closet to the right, followed by a laundry room and the guest bath. Standing at the front door, you look straight into the guest bedroom. The rest of the apartment opens to your left on the approach. Most of it is an open concept. A living room with a couch, a chair, a coffee table, and the TV are separated by that notional wall from the kitchen island. A dining room table with four chairs is between the exterior wall and the kitchen area. Along the left wall, opposite the dining room, is our bedroom. We have a corner unit, so pretty much every room has a window. Now, in the meantime, we got our family back together. My wife brought the cat, Randall, after Randall Flagg from the stand. Nice. And, and the dog, Sterling, after Sterling K. Brown from This Is Us. I introduced her to my work friends and bosses, and we settled in for the long haul. We bought a helium balloon tank to do some gender reveal pictures for our families back home. We never got rid of that balloon after the pictures, planning for the cat to have some fun with it before we admitted to spending $40 on that damn thing for one use. The cat has the cat kept his distance from the giant onesie-shaped blimp of a balloon that roamed the main open concept area between the two bedrooms. Before last night, I hadn't thought about how many times that balloon made me jump in the night. The dog usually wakes up a little after midnight to take him on a late night pee. The balloon has changed heights and positions all on its own. I know scientifically cold air is more dense. 
that could explain the different heights. And drafts scooted along. But if I read into it, there were also many times when it would be posted up in the doorway to the guest bedroom. I'd be bringing Sterling back inside and see what I thought was a person. I'd jump, gasp, turn on the light, and feel like an idiot before dousing the light and going back to bed, a lot of the time laughing at myself. There have even been a few times when the wife and I will be lying on the couch watching a movie without either of us noticing that the balloon is just hovering over her belly slash our son, as if to announce that it's a boy. We know, ghost. We were at the ultrasound. I think we may have been the ones to tell you. I told my wife that the balloon creeped me out when it did that. The next time we noticed the balloon, it was above me. Cut to last night, and this is the big one. I'd accidentally overdid the pre-workout on the way to the gym and wasn't feeling great. I just couldn't go to sleep. I was sore and everything felt wrong. Lying in bed, periodically checking the time, watching my sleep time slip away until I'm nuzzled. It's Sterling. He needs to go. I look at the time. It's just a little after 3 a.m. I'm oddly alert, but I do feel like I did get some sleep. The night is strikingly beautiful. The moon is full and there's that kind of fog that will make any schmuck say, this makes me think of the exorcist. It's me. I'm that schmuck. (laughs) I've got the energy and time, so we walk around the complex. Nobody else is out and Sterling walks well for me. He does his business, I clean it up, the dynamic of our teamwork. I take the good boy upstairs into the apartment and he jogs along, cutting to the left to take my place in bed. I stop at the end of the hall and I see my wife, sitting up with our son, looking out the window. I can't tell you how long I sat and watched her. She looked back at me, holding the boy. I couldn't move again. I knew I had to go to bed. I gave the mental commands. You need to go to bed go lay down. This time, something else responded from another part of me. Nope, that one isn't your wife. The woman. The woman and I sat looking at each other for a beat. I couldn't figure out how I knew that she wasn't my wife. Then I had the realization that gave me that justified fear that I'd been missing. My wife was barely halfway through her pregnancy. I think this upsets the woman. She stands. She's looking at me, but facing the window. Like before, it's significantly darker than it was when I first saw her. She lets the baby go, and he rolls down to the floor. It sounds to me like he keeps rolling towards me when a black dog slips out the door trotting past me. Not an aggressive pursuing sprint, but he was moving with a purpose, and he's headed for my bedroom. Then I feel it. The internal nope. I do move, though. I run to my bedroom, stomp kicking the dog on my way. I'm barefoot, and I feel fur and bone and the strangest sort of sadness as this thing slides across the floor. I slam the door behind me. My wife and dog start awake. After a moment, everyone quiets down. Before I can explain what's going on out in the main room, my alarm goes off. 6.30? Was I out there for three hours? I told the wife that I fell into the door trying to get dressed in the dark. I looked out and everything was normal except for the fact that one dining room chair was missing from the table and the ones that were still in the dining room were lined up along the wall rather than in their proper pushed into the table way that non-psychopaths keep their furniture. (laughs) I don't think I have to tell you where I found the missing chair, but for the sake of closure, it was in the guest bedroom, next to the window, under the balloon. I called in sick today. I'm not going to tell my wife what happened. I am going to find a way out of my current lease, even if that means taking something important in this unit, breaking it, and asking the complex to let us switch apartments while it gets fixed. By then, hopefully, I'll have a new dig lined up and a plausible story to explain the sudden move to my family. So that's going to be an all-day thing. Good luck with everything you guys have going on. Thanks for the work you guys put into the podcast. Much love. Soon to be former tenant. And that was anonymous, right? Like yeah, for, former tenant. Yeah, yeah. former tenant. Because um, that very funny, very very good, very funny. Yeah, very good writer. Uh huh. Um, and just a very interesting story. Yeah. I mean, like that weird, almost like a lucid dream at the end, but then things are moved around the place, and like the missing, like what three hours, three uh-huh. and a half hours. What was it, the three to six or three to six thirty? I think three hours. Yeah. And uh, man, a lot going on. And then like, what's going on with that balloon? I don't know. I don't, there's so many weird things there of like mm-hmm. the, what happened that night. And just in general, I mean, you know, he the, the first time he sees the woman, I, yeah. I'm with him or her, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I'm with them in the idea that like you could completely dismiss it away. You yeah. could be like, it's yeah. a bad dream. It was this. It was that. Like right. that's not really an encounter. What happened? I don't know. Doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. But then the culmination of all these things, uh, I'm sorry, the accumulation of all these things. Right. How it builds that final like crazy thing too. Yeah. I know. Like, okay, let's talk, let's talk about the balloon. Yeah. So 
first of all, how did it even last that long? <laughs> right, right. Helium or not, balloons, I'm assuming if, usually when they're those gender reveal, they're um, just the latex, just the, those mm -hmm. ones eventually just kind of shrivel up. It's not even a mylar balloon, which are like the big fancy ones. Oh yeah. That are kind of like, look like almost like aluminum foil. Exactly. Yeah. So how it lasted that long is beyond me. Why is it hovering over his wife's belly? But I hear, again, he, she, I, I hear what they're saying about like, well, you know, like there could be a draft. It kind of like blows it in this direction. The right. temperature changes. It expands. It shrinks. Doing a good job of justifying. But when the end result is a chair gets moved from the dining room to a guest bedroom, it's under a window where he or she or they yes, saw, this. Saw, saw the woman standing looking out a window with the balloon hanging out. I'm fucking out. I'm yeah. smart. He's getting the fuck out. I'm so proud. Yeah, and, and and they were and they said that like okay when they the squish the stomp stomp kick the dog, uh in the hallway they felt it felt it squish all that but then obviously there's nothing there and, and then like when their wife woke up they were like by the door I guess going into the room right is like by the where the hallway was I'm trying to think of their position oh so the I'm um, sorry. What I'm picturing is that the person was walking down the hallway because that like weird black dog shows up yeah. and is making a beeline for their bedroom. Right. So, so then and they, they're running to chase the dog, right? Yeah, they're running to make sure that it doesn't get in there. So then they run in their bedroom, slam the door behind them, and the dog doesn't get in there. But but when they um when their wife woke up, mm -hmm. they were standing. Because they, they said they made some excuse. Oh, yes. Well, because, but they had taken the dog out, their actual dog out to pee. So it makes sense that they right, were. Right, so it's definitely. Cause, cause but it just, those it, three hours are missing, so. <laughs> yeah, because it felt like a dream sequence for a while there. Right. You know, with all the, just such a, <laughs> trying to use a different adjective. See? Weird. Uh, I actually wanted to say it in a non-joking way, wild there. But it felt so, like, weird um, that, that, I, that I would want to say it was, like, yeah, lucid dream. Mm -hmm. But then when you're. You're definitely awake because you're up. Like you took the mm -hmm. dog out. Like like ah, that's yeah, yeah. That's just a very strange, strange story. It was wild. <laughs> like it legitimately was. L legitimately, we're gonna rename this podcast. Wild, interesting, cool ghost stories. <laughs> scared and wild. Wick. Scared and interesting. We just call it Wick. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the variety of these stories. Mm -hmm. I know. I feel like in the last like two weeks we've had. All over the place in a mm -hmm. good way, you know, because it can't just be haunted houses and Ouija boards every week. Well, and, and just like the, oh, the, not symptoms, evidence, the mm -hmm. evidence that pops up, like it has been some new stuff. Like there was this story, I think now I get, I get confused. I think I told it for last week's episode about the cuts that turn into, they just go away, but then there's scars left there. Oh yeah. That's part of the slaughterhouse. The slaughterhouse canyon. Yeah. That was something I don't remember hearing about. Mm -hmm. And then, and then with, uh, we haven't, I don't think we've talked about demon dogs or these these shadowy dogs showing up but then that story just like the sequence of events and the balloon and uh yeah the the dog that you step on but then there's nothing there and then the the way the woman was with the chairs mm -hmm. like the psychopathic like arranged on the wall and one of the guests it's like i don't remember hearing details like that in another story previously no because sometimes i mean not that there's anything wrong with them. If the details are what they are and it happens to be like footsteps in the attic and all those things, right. those things are plenty creepy. But there are certain things that tend to show up a lot in mm -hmm. hauntings. Opening and shutting doors, opening and shutting drawers, uh, the sound of footsteps, mm -hmm. whispering, scratching in the walls. But then every once in a while, you get these things where like, I've never heard of that before. Like, what the hell's going on there? Remember when Penny was whispering last night? Oh, my God. That there, was so creepy. Yeah, that was so creepy. It sounded like it was the way Penny was breathing, Our one of our dogs. <laughs> Yeah, she was like she it's was like a nose whistle or something. Because it, it is funny, like Gigi will almost have a snore sometimes. She'll do like a little dog snore. I mean, it is the cutest thing. And it's pretty cute sounding. But then every once in a while, Penny will do some weird breathing. But last night it was just so quiet, and we're laying there, and, and, and we just hear it. And it was she was at the she doesn't usually sleep at the foot of the bed. Mm -hmm. Usually sleeps in between us, which we're trying to stop her from doing that. She's such an asshole. Um, so it sounded like it could be coming from like by the door. Yeah, and you just hear this. <sighs> I know it sounded like a voice for a second and I was not about to investigate it. You did a good job. You popped right up. You put your ear next to Penny's head and you're like, it's Penny. It's yeah, for yeah. sure Penny. And then you stay there for a couple of breaths to really, really confirm. confirm it. Yeah. Cause it weirded me out too. I know. Well, and I actually thought, cause I have one of those like hatch, you know, my, my night, uh, sound thing and it, mm -hmm. my, it's like, you know, it's an alarm clock, but it has nighttime meditations and then it can mimic the sunrise in the morning. There's guided meditations and it sounded like the guy's voice for a second. So it's like, oh, it's just my meditations yeah, yeah. going off inexplicably, but 
Nope. Nope. Just Penny in the nose whistle. <laughs> Between last week's episode and this, we have the the orb in the closet that turned out to be you with your phone. That uh, I am so mad that I missed that opportunity to seriously scare you. I saw the the floating moth and bug thing over my hotel bed. <laughs> What's going to be a happen trick of this light. week? Yeah, now after all these different things, and then the dog, the whispering that turns out to be the dog's breathing. Now it's going to be, now my guard's going to go down. And there's going to oh. be something else happening. I'm like, oh, whatever. And then find out later, it's like, no, I wasn't in the closet. Yee. Eat you, Wawa. You want to do Annabelle's first or me this week? Oh, uh, you can go first, my friend. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the following Annabelle's for supporting us on Patreon, uh, allowing us to donate to that really cool uh, dental charity. What is the name of that charity again? The Halo Network. The Halo Network. And all the donations uh, we do every month. Which, by the way, if you're a dentist and you're listening to this, you can join the Halo Network if that's something of interest to you. Oh, yeah. Donate your skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to thank the following uh, Annabelle's. Uh, Zane Husky, Mike Check, 37, <laughs> Maria uh, Sk Oh, boy. Um, oh, wow. This is quite a name. Schle Schlegelmich. I think Maria, I, I'm sure you had this name butchered daily. I think I double checked it to make sure that it was spelled correctly, and it is S C H L E G E L M I L C H. Wait, can I see it? I can't. Schla Schlagelmich Schlagelmich. That's one of those things when you hear it, you're like, of course, and then it's easy once you get it. Once. Well, maybe it's not. Sh maybe it, maybe something silent in there, like Schlagelmich. Maria might be pronounced wild. Maria wild. Maria, interesting. Uh, Kale, Car uh, Carol Pollen, Devin Hampton. Daniel Fernandez, C.J. Hammond, Lonnie LaForce, uh, Sarah and Gary O, Amy Fink. I nailed Fink. I'm positive on that pronunciation. Good job. Laura Robertson, also nailed it. Jocelyn, Seth Manning, Big, e, Big EV, 1992, Ronald T. Bloyd, Kelsey Beam, Acacia Ennis, Whitney Huckaba, Amanda Faraker Hayes, or Four Acre Hayes. Four Acre. Amanda, are Four you- Four Acre. Amanda, are you Amanda Four Acre from Parma Heights, Ohio with a brother named Matt? Because he had a sister named Amanda. Okay. Just Amanda checking. Four Acre Hayes. Uh, Trey Lee Powell, Lane Williams, Chris Grabaskus, Bunny Hollers, <laughs> <laughs> and Robbie Van Dusen. Good job, Dan. Thank you. Robbie Van Dusen sounds like a wrestler. Oh, Weighing in at 285 pounds, Robbie Van Dusen, the goosen from Muskegon. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it's, what, I'd, I'd have to think a little harder for his nickname. Do you have wrestling on the brain because we've been watching Glow? I, I didn't think I did, but maybe. That was a great show. Matthias mm, Atencio, Ruby Sue, Christy Honey, Jeremy Greenwood, John Rogers, Maida Cox, Mata, Mata, Ryan Kozup. Vidalia Prince, Faye McDonald, Mark Mazzi, Christy Selijov, Selijov, John Myers, Juliana, Rachel Moshe, Ryan Hall, Kayla Littlewolf, Justin Dottie, George Monroe, Mik uh, Mikhail Kenny, or maybe Michael, Michael Kenny, Junior Rivas, Professor Ducky. Junior Rivas or Rivas? R I V A S. Revis? Revis. Revis? Okay. Junior Revis. Way to trick me. <laughs> Leslie Gamola, Cindy Scan uh, Scalmi, Nancy Ianelli, Linda Rowe, and Jaslyn Santos. Y'all had rough names this week. There was just like a, a, a totality of difficult last names to say. A couple of you did great. Jocelyn Santos, good job. Uh, Lane Williams, good job. Ruby Sue. I mean, come on. R good job. It was very difficult. Maria Shlugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugugug
Thanks to Joe Paisley for producing and directing today, Zach Cohen for custom soundbed creation, Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails, and to our book editor, Drew Atana, for polishing and preparing the listener stories for the third upcoming book. Thanks to producer Sarah Finch and Olivia Lee for finding both of the stories I told today. Subscribe to Badgic, Bad Magic Productions on Badgic. YouTube. Badgic Productions. Bad what Magic. was it last week? I don't know. It was Bad mer- mer- Mergic. Mergic or something. Bad, would- <laughs> bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch the show. Uh, follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content at Scared to Death Podcast. And we have a private Facebook group called Creeps and Peepers. Thanks to Liz Herman- Hernandez for moderating. <laughs> I, I jumped to moderating. Liz Hernandez. <laughs> It's wild. So interesting. If you don't uh, want to hear more ads, if you want monthly bonus episodes, check out our Patreon. Get the entire catalog ad-free and so much more. Enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. I hope it was cool, interesting, and wild. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness. And remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but has no home here within scared to death. Add magic productions. 